Yes, Sarah, go ahead. Good morning and welcome to the Kamla Raheja Memorial Lecture Series and the Dissertation Colloquium of the Bachelor of Architecture 2022. The Kamla Raheja Memorial Lecture Series, supported by the Kamla Raheja Foundation, is an annual event held by the KRVIA to discover new directions in architecture and urban practice and pedagogy. Every year, a different issue concerning contemporary spatial practices is examined and deliberated upon as it enables the Institute to open out new avenues and horizons for exploration. These are effectuated through multidisciplinary forums, seminars, lectures, exhibitions, and workshops, wherein a wide range of issues, including questions of the domain of architectural thinking, housing, infrastructure, history, and heritage are addressed. This year, the theme, city, culture, and architecture, attempts to probe the city, urban phenomena, and architecture through the lens of culture. Before we move on to the other events scheduled for today, may I request Manoj Parmar, Director of KRVIA, to now address us. Thank you. Good morning to all attendees, uh, and uh, good evening to the viewers from the other side of the globe. Uh, I welcome you all to Kamla Raheja Memorial Lecture uh, 2022 series. Uh, KRMLS, this is how uh, popularly it is known as, has been an important platform for exploring architecture and urban questions through various discipline discourses. As Sara has already uh, uh, defined uh, the nature of the theme, urban culture, architecture, and question of identity. Uh, these questions are uh, very central to our, 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 our uh, academic setup. Uh, the reasons are several. Uh, cities are uh, rapidly transforming, constantly becoming homogeneous place in the process of global negotiation in network. The process has begun way back in historically when industrialization of urban centers were transformed into a production house for material. The advent of internationalism, postmodernism, contemporary architectural trends that are constantly shaping its position and creating dualities of practices where urban thinkers are prominently endorsing the idea of place, community, and environment in recent time while architectural practices very often reduce to an enterprise for global aesthetics, which is more seemingly a product of constant conflict as con conflict becomes stronger. It's not coming, going, coming, going. Such dualities are constantly bringing newer conflicts and issues, compelling urban and architectural critics to rethink the nature of urban processes and questioning architectural production that are appropriate to place and reinforces the question of region. The conflict and seeking way out are, appear to be more intense than ever in the history of urbanism. The theme attempts to articulate the city, urban phenomena, and architecture through lens of culture. It is an interdisciplinary understanding of culture, which is in state of flux, shaped by city, its identity and its architecture. With this note, I would like to invite Dr. Binti Singh to introduce today's keynote speaker, Charles Wolf, and his latest publication of the book. Thank you. Binti? Yeah. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, Charles R. Wolf is one of the most important voices in multinational urbanism today, offering a fresh perspective on how we maintain the culture and character of our cities. He is a UK based multinational urbanism consultant and the author of uh, Sustaining a City's Culture and Character, the third on a trilogy of books addressing how to determine the intrinsic identities of cities and urban places. He is a recent visiting scholar in Sweden, Fulbright specialist in Australia, 
for an award-winning project and long-term American environmental and land use lawyer. He holds graduate degrees in law and regional planning with 37 years of experience in environmental land use and real estate law. He is founder and principal advisor of Seeing Better Cities Group, has practiced at several law firms and has served as a long time affiliate associate professor in the College of the Built Environments at the University of Washington in Seattle. He has been a frequent radio and and uh, podcast guest written regularly for many publications, including The Atlantic, The Atlantic City, City Lab, Governing City Metric, Planet, Planetizen, The Huntington Post, Wrist and Crosscut. He blogs at sustainingplace.com. He is also the author of Seeing the Better City, which was published in 2017, finalist for a 2018 UK National Urban Design Award and Urbanism Without Effort, which is the second book published in 2019, both from Island Press. Now, a little bit about today's talk, the future of our cities and urban life has become in the wake of the huge upheaval brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic. Terms such as authenticity, culture, character, and uniqueness are thrown around in discussions about the kind of urban environments we want to live in. But what do we really mean by that? So his talk, which is titled "Learning the Learning," uh, uh, sorry, uh, "Learning the City in Transformative Times," uh, he is going to uh, address this very idea based on his new book. Sustaining a City's Culture and Character, which he co-authored co with Tigrin Hass, which explores how we can understand and respond sensitively and creatively to the individual needs of each public place, neighborhood, or city, creating an urban world that is distinctive and desirable to live in. He will relate examples from the UK and internationally that underline the critical importance of context and offer the solutions bend the past and the future. They include moving a small Swedish city, uh, reviving Irish market towns and revitalization efforts adjacent to London's Waterloo Station. He will also summarize the book's learn method, which is very important. Look, engage, assess, review and negotiate, which provides a comprehensive approach to how we can think about, analyze, and implement more effectively a sustainable urban culture and character in transformative times. So over to you, Charles. Please take over and welcome once again to India <laughs> and to KRVIA for the special like. Over to you. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Manoj and Binti. It's an honor to um, be with you. Um, and um, I'm going to be presenting, hopefully within a 40 minute period, uh, a PowerPoint, which um, explains my point of view about cities, um, tries in, I hope, a modest way to present this interdisciplinary background that I've been fortunate enough to have. And I want to stress the word context because I'm very much a believer in understanding, as Binti said, the intrinsic identity of an urban place at many scales before one goes forward with planning, designing, placemaking, whatever the term of art you may choose for uh, transforming an urban place. So I'm going to, um, as a team's um, um, person who is really more familiar with Zoom. <laughs> I'm going to start my presentation and hopefully we will be um, underway very shortly. Um, I think I'm almost there. Um, one moment, I just need to start the production here. And um, 
Uh, did are... you share the sound, Charles? Yes, I did. Um, Great. We'll find it. We'll find out if I didn't. But thank you. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay, so um, I'm going to be talking mainly about this third book, which was published quite recently, last year in both the United States and um, by June, it began to be, by June 2021, pandemic delayed, of course, it began to be available around the world. Um, and um, this was an endeavor um, for me, which I must thank my colleague, uh, Tigran Haas, during the time that I was a visiting scholar at the um, former Center for Future of Places at the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm, the center sunsetted, as we say, um, last autumn. But I had a very, very um, wonderful um, four-year involvement with the center and um, the Axon Johnson Foundation um, in Sweden funded uh, much of what you're going to see today. I do want to stress in this cutout of the cover a very kind review segment, not not based on ego, but based on um, my my utmost agreement, and that is by um, Professor Matthew Carmona from the University College of London, who's a very well-known urban design scholar in the United Kingdom. He says that this book, as you can see, it's the third one down. He says this is all about context and um, Indeed, I've already told you that that's what I hoped people would would um, see this book as representing. Um, now, I'm fortunate by time zone um, perspective to be speaking to you from my hometown of Seattle, where I'm here visiting family. Um, and I wanted to start with some tributes. One is to my father who um, has not been with us since 1989, but he was a fairly well-known urban design scholar based here in Seattle and is known to be the modern founder of the Department of Urban Design and Planning at the University of Washington. Um, he was among the early generation of urban designers along with Kevin Lynch and others. And as you can see, he knew how to draw, he knew how to sketch. And this is actually a town in Croatia. Um, but I did want to say that although I am a neophyte about India, um, I have always wanted to visit because my father was in India during World War II um, as a captain in the um, US Army Air Corps. And he never stopped talking about his experiences. And hence, even at my now advanced stage, I do hope to visit for real one of these days. My second tribute is to Dr. Binti Singh for having me here. We've gotten to know each other at least virtually quite well over the last couple of years. And I do want to stress that although you're going to hear a somewhat um, Northern Hemisphere centric talk, a perhaps Western culture centered talk, I'm very conscious that um, the Global South is uh, more important than ever before with regard to so many aspects of um, urban challenge today, including public health, climate, and justice. And Dr. Singh has really led the way in being a modern voice in India about the issues that are very important around the world, but from an Indian context, and there's that magic word again. And I think um, I this is from one of Binti's more populist publications, not one of her scholarly ones. And I apologize for a picture of Venice being right in the middle of this section of the book, but I did want to give due credit for Binti for her thinking. And um, it is, um, um, I don't have the page number. Actually, I do. It's on page 143 of Sustaining a city's culture and character. So I always begin these talks and my thoughts about urbanism issues with a very simple notion that sometimes is forgotten, oddly enough, and that is there are so many universals we are dealing with around the world. And I've always been interested since I started writing about cities, um, in about 2009, after practicing law, 
as a what we call a land use lawyer in the United States, an environmental lawyer for many years. Um, I began in 2009 to amass that list of publications that Binti was kind enough to recite. And I really don't know why, other than it was osmosis from my father leaking out when I was already 50 some years old. I perhaps had um, suppressed the uh, urbanist in me for so many years, even though I was practicing in the trenches, as we say, getting permits and representing um, developers and cities and so on, I began to start really writing about it in a, in a more creative way. And I really was traveling a lot by that time and came up with some notions of um, something like this, that here we see commercial storefront in um, Arusha, Tanzania, and in Seattle, Washington. Seattle, the home of Starbucks Coffee, one of the many branches on the bottom. And then the same storefront, in a sense, not a coffee shop, but there's a woman with a smartphone in front of it. Um, but it's expressing itself in context because, of course, the infrastructure is different. The curb is different. The method of travel is different. The signage is different. Um, we're obviously looking at a first world versus third world situation. So we can read issues of economy. And of course, we can even see the dramatic African sky and begin to, if we immerse ourselves to think more deeply about how these fundamental human attributes are expressing themselves in Africa and in the United States. Now, that led that kind of thinking led to my first book, which as Binti pointed out, was revised in 2019. And what I read about, which people felt was quite strange for a practicing lawyer back then in 2013, was the notion that before we go forth with planning, designing, and so on, the same notion that I mentioned at the introduction of this lecture, we need to understand the fundamentals the fundamental relationships, the first principles between people and the places they live. And as you can see, this book, which is a short book um, and fairly digestible, um, focuses on the close grain, the importance of organic, naturally occurring urbanism, and arguing for a rediscovery of this underlying simplicity. Now, some people, my detractors, like to say I've written the same book three times. And in some ways I have, and I'm proud of that because each time it's gotten a little bit better. But Urbanism Without Effort looked at a variety of scenarios, including um, the evolution of the wheeled vehicle on the lower left, um, how in Croatia um, on the top, the upper, upper left, the former palace of the Emperor Diocletian evolved into the city of Split with those walls still present and um, now an urban core, which my father, who I mentioned earlier, sketched back in the 1970s on the right. Also in the middle there, you see the evolved um, caves, the Sassi of Matera, Italy, one of the European cities of culture not too long ago. Again, an organically evolving and often very sustainable um, example of um, an urban place. So Urbanism Without Effort covered those kinds of vignettes. Urbanism Without Effort also proposed something that I'd written about in some articles and kept writing about, and that is, um, the Urban Diary. And the Urban Diary is a way for anyone really, whether an individual or a sophisticated professional to, in a way, journal, but it's more than journaling. It's really about understanding the city around him or her. And that became a how-to book in seeing the better city. 
And seeing the better city is designed to help people really understand their responses to various attributes of the urban environment. It also merges traditional analog methodologies, photography and whatnot, with more digital technologies. And I have a little video that will save us all some time that explains seeing the better city. And I think I have the sound on. Mamto will scream at me if I don't. But let's look at this video for just a couple of minutes before we go on. My name is Chuck Wolf, and I wrote a book called Seeing the Better City. It's designed to help people look around. By looking around, I mean helping people express their perceptions about where they live, work, and visit in a way that's helpful during times of urban change. My aim is to deliver really a, a comprehensive user's guide to interpreting the city dwellers world. A critical part of creating better cities is soliciting and incorporating input from those that, that know a place most intimately, the citizens that live and work there every day. My Urban Diary tool provides a way for everyone to easily document urban environments as well as to serve as a planning tool for city leadership. By and large, the tool today is really our, our, our smartphones. Our ability to share those photographs in social media and the ways in which in the smart city, our social media photos are being used to analyze on a mega scale, what our cities can be. I like to say that the book takes you from the Parisian wanderer, the flaneur, all the way up to Pokemon Go. The reason that's important is because we need to go back to the classic form of observation to really understand what we see when we look at buildings and streets and our transportation networks. What is our emotional reactions to that? The, you're going to go through the same process if you use your smartphone. The book spends a lot of time encouraging people to find vantage points around their city, what I like to call urban mirrors, so that they can observe human conduct in place and see behavior that's gonna remind them of their own conduct. From such human observatories, we can really reflect on, on who we are. Okay, thank you for watching that. That that helped save some time about seeing the better city. And you might ask, well, you already wrote those two books. Why did you have to write a third one? Good question. But the thing is that in the first two books, I was very two-dimensional. And although I certainly understood that architecture. And, I'm sorry? Can you, can everyone hear me? Yes, yes. Please go ahead, Chuck. Okay, I'm sorry. Please yes, go ahead. Yes, okay. Yeah. yeah, someone needs to probably mute themselves. Yes, anyway. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. yeah this, is, this is technology. Um, anyway, um, I um, realized that the first two books um, were very two-dimensional, and although it's easy to um, understand how architecture reflects underlying culture and um, climate and any other factor you might want to uh, mention, economy and so on, all the, the, this multidisciplinary perspective that I've already alluded to, um, the process, in especially in seeing the better city, was 
really how to um, take visual cues or auditory cues, um, I began to realize that, oh my God, not everyone can see. And yet, nonetheless, that book was important because it did begin to ask some underlying questions. And I'm not sure everybody understood that this wasn't just a book about pretty pictures or um, beautiful places. It was a book that was intended to bring out the difference, and this is in Stockholm, between a public art sculpture on the left and just 200 meters away, a homeless person in the same place. I was asking people to look across a social spectrum as well. It was visually driven, but it was intended to be provocative. And I was living in Seattle at the time, and so I spoke to issues in my own neighborhood, like here in Seattle, there's been this, the luxury of an American city that can fight about whether single family housing is the only justifiable way to live or not. And this, this battle for affordability and for different forms of housing goes on today, even, you know, it's so much more than in the rest of the world where um, what is called middle housing or low income housing or affordable housing is, is something that may be an issue, but it's been in place for time immemorial. Here in Seattle, I was provoking people by saying, oh, look at the house on the left. It's not a house. It's actually got six families in it. It's a, it's a multifamily dwelling, but it looks like a house. And look at the house on the right. Well, that's not even used as a house. That's used by a landlord to store plumbing parts for houses he owns in the neighborhood. Or I would provoke with a homeless tent and ask people how comfortable they were with a homeless person having a view. These were issues that I wanted people to think about here in the United States five years ago. And I hoped that people would take that to heart in varying forms of their own urban diaries. And if you read Seeing the Better City and it's recounted in the new book as well, uh, there are methods to go forth with an urban diary based on a previous method that was almost purely two-dimensional called LENS, look, explore, narrate, and summarize. And here's how this might play out. We don't have time to go into it today. This may be a book you'll be interested in looking at. It's fairly readily available um, to this day. And I took the Urban Diary method with me as I, as I grew and had opportunities in Australia and Europe and, um, and um, of course, here in the United States and began to experiment with this tool in many, many places. You'll see on the left, a small city here in Washington State in the United States. And then you see Paris and the Place des Vosges and you see Stockholm and so on. And I, I should say, I'll go back and say, there are many types of urban diaries. They could be thematic. My obsession with context was apparent then and as was my people place focus. I helped people understand the traps of what they saw, the nostalgia of the Eiffel Tower and perhaps spending a honeymoon there or the power of overlays, juxtapositions to define where um, battles, development battles were taking place, as well as this homeless person's tent that I showed you before, where I was encouraging people to understand their condition responses to that person has no right to be there, or yes, they do, it's a public place, that's where we should be housing people who cannot find other places to live. Now, then I began to learn more, <laughs> and that it's not so simple as two-dimensional 
visual observation and that we move, we settle. Movement and settlement is something that the American foundational urbanist Lewis Mumford talk about, talked about it, uh, movement and settlement. We rebuild and we travel, at least we used to travel before the pandemic. But I began to realize what a blend the city is of disciplines and histories and the natural environment and the built environment and continua between old and new and tall and short and so on and so forth. And that it was such a multiplicity, we couldn't just speak in two dimensions. And so came the new book and its cover. The cover is actually in Scotland. This is Inverness. And it shows the view from the castle in Inverness, but it's 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 subtle and it's intended to show buildings that are being renewed, regenerated. And it's also intended to show people who, if you look carefully, are not native of Scotland. And I don't say that in any judgmental way. I say that as a very important factor in how we understand the intrinsic identity of what places are now. And so, with questions like this, with a real laneway in Melbourne versus a Seattle developer who has created a laneway in the midst of her building, I began to ask, well, contextually, what is appropriate? And is that okay to steal an idea from Melbourne, put it in the middle of a building in Seattle, not in a public right of way, not in a naturally occurring way, but in a way that will attract people? Is that an okay thing to do? Or, for instance, I talk about in the new book, a placemaking tool that was popular in Portugal, in Avera, Portugal, in 2011. The idea of suspending umbrellas in the air and creating delight in an urban place. But does it belong on a commercial street in an Italian hill town on the left? which is pretty interesting without those umbrellas or in a legendary gal shopping gallery in Paris? Why are we taking these things around the world without regard to whether they belong there? And the answer may simply be because they make us happy and that's okay. But I would ask people to think about this a little bit first before they simply say, oh, that worked in Portugal, so we are going to make it work here. Now, not everyone agrees with me about that, but I'm encouraging people to think more comprehensively. So here's the book. Here's some fundamental notions in the book. Cities are not chameleons. They should not imitate one another without an analysis of what worked there will work here. These phenomena are mixtures of art and science. We must ask how to discover and perpetuate the intrinsic identity of a place. I call it an urban diary plus, 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 because I started adding things to my earlier thinking. The role of the global and local blend, which Binti certainly alluded to in the snippet that I quoted her in, and the case studies and so on that are in the book that I will um, talk about at the end of the talk in about 10 minutes, 10 or 15 minutes. Um, I wanna thank my friend, collaborator, Kadeem Navarro, who is currently in the United States, but she was a Parisian artist um, at the time, and I used several of her paintings um, as sort of the art part of all of this as well. Now, one thing I point out in the book is that we always think a place 
is two-dimensional. It's something we can experience and see. That goes back to my earlier thinking. Well, guess what? For those of you who've traveled to the United Kingdom, you know that on Baker Street, 221B Baker Street is the house that Sherlock Holmes lived in, the detective, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's de primo detective, primo English detective. But Sherlock Holmes didn't really exist, did he? Nor did platform nine and three quarters at King's Cross Station where Harry Potter went off to Hogwarts. And I know that many of you are familiar with the Harry Potter series because it's, of course, an international phenomenon as well. The point is perhaps a place is real if you imagine it. And a place that is only a text city place has become, these places have become major tourist attractions in London. Now, what does that say about what place is? It's more than two dimensions. It's beginning to verge on the metaverse of Facebook and meta now, um, isn't it? And then we look at the trends that are so important and popular today. Greeting the city, the natural environment with the city, the meeting place of the built and the natural environments, and the various contextual ways that they express themselves. Here in Paris, we see the beginning of Mayor Hidalgo's efforts to green up Paris already underway, this is on the Rue de Martyr, on the way to Montmartre. Here, we see many snippets of the national parks, the urban national parks that are in Stockholm. Um, and some people have said, well, shouldn't you be comparing that in Stockholm with um, the Luxembourg Gardens in Paris and, you know, have more of a one-to-one -one comparison. And I answer, yeah, you could do that. But what I'm trying to show is um, the inherent ways in which um, two European cities have and are expressing their natural environments. And just to think about context and what fits where and why. I think you're beginning to learn that I don't give answers, but I ask many questions. And a lot of people get very frustrated with me for that, but I'm going to keep doing it. So before too long, I found myself, oh my God, I've written a trilogy. And this last book is the capstone of the trilogy. And they all talk about context. But another thing I talk much more about in the new book is the phenomena that many of you are aware of, no doubt, of co-creation. And that is that urban change is not dictated solely from government above or develop or real estate developers above, but also from the ground up. The importance of local expression and local expertise in influencing how places change. This is co-creation bottom up and top down, and somewhere in the middle they meet through either a regulatory structure, a consultation structure, or perhaps insurrection, <laughs> but they present different opportunities. And on the left in Melbourne, Australia is actually a district that is on its way to becoming a technology area. And the local businesses were showing the government of, um, Victoria and the technology companies, what was important to save in that um, process. And you have, this is expression in Portugal and London of sort of naturally occurring environments as well that might provide some inspiration in those contexts. And it continues. 
based on history and nature and so on. Dead center here is Mount Rainier here in Seattle, an almost 15,000 foot mountain. Um, when I'm in the when I'm in the UK and the um, US, I can never convert to meters. I apologize. Um, when I'm in Europe, I can. It's it's context, you know. And then the surrounding photos are all where I've been living in a town um, 40 miles west of London called Newbury. Um, and they are different reflections of local character. And I say character with a funny inflection because one of my main points in the book is that character, words like character and authenticity and culture mean nothing until we understand their context. And we need to be very careful about people who are looking for for authentic experiences or character, retention of character, because that can be manipulated. Um, I began to explore when I started thinking more about these concepts for this book, um, examples, and I, there are several case studies in the book, and one of them is uh, what I think is a remarkable attempt to rediscover the fabric and DNA of five or six old market towns in Ireland. And I had the good fortune to meet some very impressive young architects in Venice back in 2019. They were part of Free Market, which was the Irish pavilion at the Biennale of Architecture in Venice. And I, I followed up with them and I went and I spent time with them in one of these market towns in Macroon near Cork. And the ways in which they were teasing out local identity and helping local residents understand their history and their underlying um, essence uh, was very impressive to me. Why? Because it was a very um, soft um, tease. And I'm using the word tease in the context of a gentle encouragement of the local populace to 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 speak freely about what they experience and what they would like without dictating from above they they sort of bless these towns with a co-creation experience that is listed um, here on this poster again that's free market the irish pavilion of the 2019 venice biennale and so the book um, continues with questions of what do you, this is two dimensional, but it's meant to be much, much more because this is the Tower of London and it's a reminder of the deep stratigraphy of the city of London and so many other places in the world. Not only do you have the medieval tower and its walls, but you have um, the former moat finally manicured. You have the uh, newer, uh, plantings. You have um, architecture from the 90s and into the millennium with a shard. Um, I ask that people look holistically at what they see and perform these stratigraphies. And before they use the words that I already alluded to, they be very, very careful. Because I can tell you that this is Isleworth in the borough of Hounslow in London, with a very old 13th century church and a delightful medieval framework right there along the Thames. But from where I'm taking this photo are some not very attractive modern apartments. And we need to be careful about that nostalgia, which I talked about earlier, when we think about going forward what is an appropriate treatment of this place. You can see the sort of um, much critiqued uh, 1980s and 90s uh, UK architecture in the church um, extension there on the right. What's that context and what were they thinking? <laughs> um, now to the pandemic, I spent the pandemic in England, the, the, the severe lockdowns and 
it was really uh, awe-inspiring for a guy originally from a place that's only about 150 years old or or a little bit more in a settled Western context, of course, an indigenous Native American history far, far um, more historic. But nonetheless, the fact I, 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 I felt a certain calm with COVID in the sense that it had all happened before. And this is a plague pit behind that church in Isleworth dating from 1665. And this is part of the essence of a place as well, as well as the currency of, of who lives there, who might be very, very different and very, very culturally um, diverse when based on a comparison with the historic architecture. This is true. This is um, the house I've been living in in Newbury. And you'll excuse the personal reference, but it it's 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 got a, a story to it. The house dates from the late 1500s, and 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 it looks to be in the middle of the country, yet it isn't. You can see it's in a it's in a it's on a busy road with a pub across the way. In this day and age, in a suburban part of Newbury, it's along a river um, where 449 bodies supposedly still somewhere are buried from a battle in the English Civil War. And again, in terms of understanding who lives in this place now, it's entirely different and very, very diverse with ethnicities from around the world. But in terms of that sort of comfort that we'll get through COVID, this is the house in the background, the house in which I've been living in the background, and some former buildings from the year 1918 in the midst of the Spanish flu pandemic. And if you look closely, you can't see it very well here, but you can with a woman who's standing front and center. She's got a bandana on, and this was in the midst of another brush with illness. And in the same place where you know I was living with COVID. And that is what we must look at in terms of the stratigraphies we um, referenced earlier. Now, I'm very proud of this section from the book. And when I've done readings of it about the book, I, I do read this section because I, I'm proud of it because I wrote it before COVID. But this is the part of the book that becomes very important. And it is what cities around the world are trying to do today in reimagining the post-COVID urban dynamic. In other words, um, as stated, and I don't need to read this to you, imagine if the city around you disappeared, or, you know, how would you recreate it? How would you recalibrate the new urban order? And you would not, you would not go back to and I apologize for the Western culture centricity of my city examples. You have your own. You would not go back to what was. You would not take a touristic reconstruction of your city after a disaster or after a pandemic. Now, it is true that many European cities were rebuilt after World War II and went through this struggle, and some look very similar to the way they did in the 19th century. But this is the exercise that I challenge people to undertake. So if I'm going to be critical of the world character, maybe I should back that up a little bit. And I'm not certainly not the first person to say this, um, a good friend of mine in England, Rob Cowan, Richard Guise, another English guy, um, uh, another gentleman I mentioned in the book, um, Kim Davi, an Australian academic, Daria Akte, Turkish academic. They've all taken a part character and pointed out that it's really an assemblage of many, many attributes beyond two dimensions, the natural environment, um, 
the economics of it all, all the things I've already alluded to. Character is ambiguous and we should not give it short shrift. And as I was writing the book, I had this, this is a mock-up of an early edition of the book. This, this is in the book, a bit rewritten. But I, I took a building in Richmond upon Thames in London where I was living at the time and I took apart its elements and began to ask, how would we determine what is this place? And as you can see, I talked about several items beyond the building. Natural systems with the flowers, if you will, public works that lie beneath, Wi-Fi kiosks in the background, and, and other things which you can scan briefly here. Of course, it leaves out the socio-cultural intangibles that are inherent in such places as well, and that often dictate what might happen to such places if the shops closed because of the pandemic, what do we replace them with? Well, uh, maybe it's housing, maybe it's an internet storefront, or, or rather a storefront with an internet business behind, who knows? And then, this is really more, I hate to put text up, but this is really more about learn that Binti uh, quoted. Look, this is an elaboration of lens. It's look, engage, assess, review, and negotiate. And it brings in the element of consultation. It brings in a very flexible way of assessing the intrinsic aspects of an urban place. I also in the book, and we don't have time to go into it today, but I, I run, learn through the context keys of familiarity, congruity, and integrity, which are intended to be action forcing devices to figure out the intrinsic fit of a new in initiative in a given neighborhood. Now, people have said, oh, come on, nobody's gonna go through all this. And my answer is, you're probably right, except in the most enabled situations. But this is a model for people to work with and think. And here it is depicted graphically in the book. And I'll let you look at that for a moment. I do know we're getting close to the end here, so I want to not hang too long. The methods involved in LEARN, and I have some photos that again are provocative here, um, they include all of the ways in which an urban place can be interpreted. And you can see them listed here. And chapter three of the book goes into summaries of many of these methods, or they speak to poetry, they speak to art, as I told you, I have several paintings from a particular artist, um, all the different ways that consultants analyze a place or academics analyze a place. Again, this is an ideal construct, but it's a very, I intend it as a very firm reminder of all that goes in to what a city is. Now, you know, I, I said I don't like two dimensions, but I like to throw this in and ask how this happened uh, and whether this is okay. <laughs> you know, um, something to think about. Um, but more seriously, if we look at a place like Berlin, we see, again, the many layers of Berlin. We see wartime damage. We see a remnant of um, West Berlin entertainment. Um, we see modern building in the background. We see transport, modern transport. And this is, um, this is, the homogenization of modern Berlin that many of you may be familiar with, and it's one reason why people like it so much, because it's reinvented itself in so many interesting ways. Um, this is the King Cross, King's Cross development in London, that sort of um, um, urban re, grand urban redevelopment project that we see in many cities, in many Western cities, the Royal Seaport in Stockholm, other other cities all you know that they, they all have speaking of berlin 
that they all have these centers of old industry that have been redeveloped. And here we see gas holders with apartments inside now. We see coal drop yards, an old industrial building redesigned um, to hold retail in an inspiring way. But this is really upper crust stuff. This is high end, um, arguably gentrified um, um, opportunity for as much lauded as the King's Cross redevelopment has been. Now, the case studies in the book, I'll go over them very, very quickly, are where, as we like to say, the rubber hits the road. And I'll go around clockwise to say I spend a lot of time with this modern new city hall and cultural center. I, I spend a lot of time talking about a mining town in northern Sweden that, based on Swedish law and the largesse of a mining company has had to relocate because the mine essentially has caused the old town center to begin to cave in on itself. And so they've moved the town center um, a kilometer and a half away. And the question is, what do they bring to the new town center? Well, they're bringing a mixture of preserved buildings they're designing new buildings with reminders of the old buildings. The modern city hall on the left looks nothing like the old city hall, except inside it has a remarkable ambiance that the townspeople love because with a mixture of stairways and so on, it reminds them of the town hall that was demolished because it was about to fall into the ground. Um, they're moving a classic Swedish country church and replicating the um, its placement on a hill with a certain angles and so on. But people began to ask questions. Are you moving the graveyard? Are you moving the woods that are near the church? One couple asked, are you moving the bench where we met 40 years ago? So this is a great opportunity to look at that reinvention exercise because it's, um, it's a rare opportunity, but it's um, a, an opportunity built on consultation and individual listening. And I tell the story how Joran Karsh, who was a former chair of the planning department at the Royal Institute of Technology, was hired as a consultant to go up there and meet with people and really listen. Now, there was an architecture firm and planners involved, but they really, through an ethnographic approach, listened hard to what the people wanted. Other examples going around um, counterclockwise. Let me go counterclockwise. Is the Irish pavilion business that I told you about. This is one of the market towns um, and the main street through the town that is essentially ruined the historic um, merchant and um, live over the shop uh, situation that was there before. The middle photo is um, the remarkable Bloomberg Uni European headquarters in London, which although high-end architecture by Norman Foster also brought a lot of opportunity to local merchants, reclaimed the oldest street in London, relocated the subterranean Mithraic temple back to its rightful place. Mayor Bloomberg in his later years understood what it was like for a developer from out of town to build a new building. And he arguably was fairly sensitive. Um, going around further counterclockwise, I spent a lot of time talking about a business improvement district in London near Waterloo Station that brings that is in the process through modern means of bringing back an historic Market Street, which once stretched from uh, uh, Black, Blackpool to Vauxhall in, uh, in London. Um, the latter two on the, you know, the upper right are two failures of context where Apple tried to locate headquarters stores. First on the top in Melbourne was denied for um, um, historic, cultural, and indigenous reasons, and in Stockholm, because um, a restaurant 
to Apple headquarters store made no sense in the context of the People's Square, Kunstergarten, and so on and so forth. This is all in the book and it all provides some application of learn in the context keys. Now I'm probably over time. I will say that the book invites holistic analysis. As you know, it looks carefully at um, the local character of, uh, this, is, this is Bristol, and I mean character in the way that um, the more expansive assemblage definition. And I wanna speak to one development in Bristol, England that has not yet occurred that I'm a little bit, dis bit disappointed about. This was an area that um, one of the most historic in Bristol that was bombed during World War II, redone as a sort of financial headquarters. Um, the old bank building here has sat for 10, 15 years. And now, and there's an old church of which the tower only remains because of World War II bombing. And it's being redesigned in a way that sounds very appealing because they want to bring back the, the historic medieval street pattern of Bristol and reconnect this area to the river. But you know what? The virtual reality walkthrough is just more of King's Cross from London. It's very generic. And I think they're bringing in the locals with the promise of a more indigenous um, um, approach, but there's still a lot of controversy about whether the developers are really listening. And so some of you may know the very famous UK graffiti artist, Banksy, who in an exhibit in Paris that honored some of his work in the public domain, I borrowed this very simple graffiti from him that maybe makes a little bit of fun of formal planning and architecture, not in any way other than to say we need to give people, everyday people, much more credit for what they can do when they're allowed to do so. And we can take these types of reuses, which I have this here for my final story. People love markets, festival markets and recreating markets in many Western cities. And in a sense, creating stylized versions of what tourists want. Well, this is under a rail, this is under a rail line in uh, London. And this is the product of what was once, I tell the story in the book of bobtail fruit that was once a fruit stall at the old Covent Garden in London, the old vegetable gar the old vegetable market. It became five market stalls at different London tube subway stations. And that no longer became or that, that became no longer a practical way to sell what they call in the UK, fruit and veg. What became the practical way? Online. And this same bobtail fruit carries on the customer relationships and the um, customer service for which they're known so well on the internet by virtual orders and delivering it to offices high quality fruit and vegetables. And in fact, they expanded to residences during the pandemic. And this is an example. Um, that's why we need to be careful because if this is how a business survives and still preserves its integrity from my context keys, the fact that it doesn't have a physical presence and its warehouse is essentially one of these, that may be okay. And we need to think very hard about context and as i said this interdisciplinary approach to really understanding what an intrinsic identity really is and i apologize for going maybe 10 minutes over but um i've been very honored to present these ideas to you and i hope that um i hope that you've um you've enjoyed the the presentation and am I back with you? I think I am. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Chuck. That was 
too much for us. We will need time to process <laughs> that information, <laughs> all, the content, uh, all, right. I, all the content. So but now I, I would request this simultaneously okay. this book, you know, okay. uh, uh, Urbanism Without Effort. I just pulled out from the library just to see and understand, uh, you know, back and forth his argument. So I've made a notes. So <laughs> Uh, we'll share with you very soon what I, 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 what I, um, I will say, I, I, I've talked enough, but Manoj, I want to thank you because you already wrote about seeing the better city, and um, I appreciate that. So now now you're getting another of the books. Thank you. <laughs> All right, yeah, over to you, Binti. Yeah, uh, I'd like to now invite our from former director of KRVIA, Anirudh Paul, and uh, he will take it forward. <laughs> and maybe introduce you to the context of India. Over to you, Anirudh. You have to unmute yourself, Anirudh. Yes. Thanks, That's, Binti. And, Thanks, Charles. Uh, you can hear me now. I'm, I'm, am yes, I audible? Yes, perf perfect, perfect. Go on. Okay, okay, okay. And uh, uh, so, so uh, importantly, like uh, Charles, like you pick up many imp important, I believe, points, which I thought, like, uh, uh, if we highlight and probably connect it to our context also. Uh, probably you can have a set of interesting questions also some of the questions will come from me so so let's uh, just to i think uh, go back to your presentation and uh, find certain points i believe where there are very interesting overlaps so the first thing which uh, comes out from your uh, talk is this whole notion of uh, the, the idea of the expert the idea of like till now, I believe the way we structure architecture, structure uh, uh, urban design planning uh, in our both in our country as well as still we come from the position of the hero and you have spoken of star architecture and uh, what you do is challenge this position. That's that's something very important. You you challenge this position of this whole idea of the expert, the idea of like uh, and this is something very important for us because like uh, i know that our school itself has been working on many projects where like they are engaging with governments okay and to give you an example like uh, uh, today we engage with certain projects which governments imagine very top down like they are very extremely top down they are they are looked on as projects which will better our cities like in the case of mumbai uh, like we know that these uh, some of these redevelopment projects which want to do away with informality which want to do away with history in certain extent by having visions which are like taken from like i, I remember even our 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 prime minister talking about how mumbai has to be shanghai so comes from completely from outside and they get replaced uh, uh, and the whole process also then comes comes from that vision that it is driven by planners, driven by the expert, and the driven by so-called the uh, the idea of uh, like a like a completely external vision coming into our cities. So, and and in such cases, you you remind and uh, what you do is you tell us that we need to be wary of such an approach. I think that's something uh, very interesting because let me tell you the fate of. E <coughs> so say, uh, a very important in, uh, international project, which was the Dharavi redevelopment project. If you have, must have heard of Dharavi, uh, it's one of the one of the largest uh, like informal settlements, and that was conceived in 2004. And uh, I think 2021, it has not seen the light of the day. And one of the reason like now uh, think about is probably the too much of a top down approach which doesn't take care of ground realities at all so 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 this whole idea of uh, challenging the position of the planner and what what does it mean then for i believe for architects architectural education is a very very important question how do we train architects then how do we train planners then 
So that's something I think a very important question that comes to us. And especially uh, like uh, when you even talk of this whole notion, because I like the idea that you come from the 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 the, the, the discipline, a very a different discipline. Though let me just tell you that we did not understand like how did the background of legality. That's something probably you can uh, probably elaborate also. How did the background of legality uh, inform this whole notion of what you have now been able to frame? Like, how did that come forth? That's something, though we got a sense of it, we got a sense of it from the fact that you talk about uh, negotiation. That's a very important term, which I thought would connect uh, to this whole idea of what your earlier practice or from where you mm -hmm. come from another discipline and also like connect to the idea of space making probably that's where the hint lies but uh, like if you could so that's something which i thought was interesting so the next part which you talk about is this notion of the urban diary uh, and, uh, and 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 uh, that's something again, uh, which I thought was interesting, which I thought again requires some deliberation. And uh, uh, though what I always find like, well, like in a, especially working in the Indian city, working in our context has been that who is allowed, who is allowed to participate in making such diaries. Though I know that uh, uh, probably in your context, the, the making of the diary and the idea of the agency or the agent who actually is behind making this diary, okay, uh, might be much empowered. Okay, uh, the question which comes in our context always is that uh, there are there is a like uh, I would say uh, a, a lot of uh, groups of communities who do, do not have a voice who do not might have the ability to be able to uh, bring forward what they imagine. Okay, it might be for various reasons. It might be for technological reasons. It might be for reasons of suppression in us in, in certain conditions which are created, which are not very explicit. They are very implicit. They are done very implicitly. So, 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 and that, and then, then that becomes a question about what shape does the urban diary take? Okay, or is it a possibility that the urban diary in such cases can uh, can play a role? Like, and, and I give you a base because uh, like coming from the city of Mumbai where 50% of our city actually is informal. Okay, uh, there are also communities which are historical. Okay, there are communities which are like, let's say tribal communities, fishing communities. Okay. Uh, whose history actually predates even our colonial history. Okay, but we don't speak of them at all. Absolutely, we don't speak of them at all. Uh, their voices are never heard also. So in such cases, and but we know that they have knowledge systems, which you also come about later. They have knowledge systems, which are very, very important, uh, crucial to addressing certain issues, which we believe can 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 be very contemporary like climate change like sustainable food production like they seem to have the answers but we don't listen to them so mm -hmm. and and as i'm saying these are not these are not uh, explicit these are very implicit they're very implicit the way we give importance to certain forms of knowledge and we uh, we uh, like disregard like this whole idea of the when we bring this metaphor of developmentalism okay and uh, like and and the image plays a role in that because we don't need to we don't need to like talk about it that we disregard disregard your knowledge but the image plays such a such a big role that implicitly you have said what's important so so the whole notion of the urban diary uh, like for me it it requires further elaboration and also further like discussion as to how it can be like thought in cases of uh, of of groups who don't seem to have a voice Mm -hmm. And uh, and and also and also like just to tell you like uh, there is a tendency there's a tendency in our cities itself now to uh, valorize the idea the idea of self interest okay and we have seen that like in in cities like Mumbai this whole idea of gated communities coming up 
okay which seem to challenge this whole idea of collective interest okay which 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 seem to challenge the idea of that that there needs to be the idea of a collective narrative getting built okay and that's something which has been very of a big concern to us especially uh, though we say talk about democracy there seems to be conflicting uh, i believe uh, uh, impulses within capitalism which actually challenges this whole idea of the collective narrative which we again and again try to bring forth though we know it we know it's very important but there seems to be a challenge there okay and uh, well the other aspect uh, which you are talking about is this whole idea of place making tool you two dimensional versus very interestingly you go go type of these narratives and their ability to build spaces and that i thought was very interesting uh, like when you spoke of the two dimension okay uh, like as an architect as i would be like an urban designer i thought that you would be taking the idea of the third dimension okay and uh, and here i'm again interestingly reminded of the fact like like i know that uh, we as urban designers all have learned kevin lynch all have learned kevin lynch okay and uh, uh, but uh, like and we try to all apply kevin lynch into our cities and i must tell you this uh, like i we were in a like uh, a trip to banaras banaras is this historical city or uh, indian historical city and we tried to apply kevin lynch there okay and we found the problem because when kevin lynch talks about landmark they become very physical absolutely the idea of physicality plays a important role and and uh, when we go to banaras uh, and when we like try to understand landmarks through the lens we you, you just don't get an idea of why people give importance to a certain place and then you realize that this uh, like framework does not just work within certain conditions certain context as you talk about and that is something i believe is very important like uh, uh, so 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 the idea of the two dimensionality what it can how this whole idea of narrative stories okay and other other layers uh, can inform alternatives i thought was interesting and just to as i to give you an example itself how the idea of certain the idea of what we th think is the physical does not give give importance to like in our context many of our cities itself where uh, a, a a corner corner itself with having no physical presence can get highly important for people because of certain associations certain and they are embedded in religion they embedded in in the in the practice of social practice of people so so that's another important that you talk about and the and the and and i believe the last thing which i'll talk about because i won't take also much time before i open the floor to questions is this whole idea of co creation the idea of co creation which is a very interesting idea in fact it comes from also my first point about challenging the notion of the the position of the planner and uh, Uh, and you you talk about the, so, so we would like we would like to know more how does co creation get enabled though we talk of it very romantically okay uh, co creation uh, might not always be happy okay the process i'm saying the process the process might be violent uh, maybe in some cases might be conflicting in some cases or is it that no that's not so so that's something which requires elaboration because again like uh, though like in in our, our like is i'm coming from again our context okay though in legality there are possibilities of co-creation okay it's not always because it's a game it's a game it's always a game with governments having different interest certain interest groups having certain more influence on people who take decisions so in such context how can co creation be articulated okay and especially given your legal background probably uh, the you must have experienced this and you must have uh, like uh, uh, like and how does this get that then get negotiated because negotiation is a very important word okay and and then how does that force even sometimes force governments i'm not saying that it's a happy 
uh, this thing they can force governments to take decisions like which might be bottom up that's the way it can come bottom up okay and uh, and yes i would lastly and finally uh, like just uh, like talk about this whole notion of the sambalaj which you like again bring forward many of as you said many scholars have brought forward also this notion of the sambalaj and and this uh, for me also uh, and for i think which krvi the school is looking at also has been very important uh, and we believe that clearly that uh, like even when we are designing when we are making form we realize that uh, like it's a multiple is multiple set of have to come together to be able to uh, like there are no easy answers these factors have to come together to be able to create certain whether it's a place whether it be uh, articulation of the public realm it has to come together to do that so with that i think i would end and uh, well uh, you can respond to that because i thought i asked some questions also within this and then we will open it up to questions for the audience yes thank you anirudh for those questions and reflections uh, over to you chuck um yes i don't want to i know you're probably a bit behind schedule but i i do want to say that um the easy answer and thank you for your thoughtful your thoughtful um commentary um the easy answer is to say it's all in the books um but um i'm going to focus just on a few things one the urban diary um yes it 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 the urban diary can be in many many forms and seeing the better city um does go into great detail about some of the things you ask chapter 5 of seeing the better city speaks to um implementation and it speaks to how the urban diary might be presented as a tool for all and how many facets of society might um participate um and how they may be given access to tools that they may not ordinarily have um it is not just the government that is doing the diaries in fact it is the citizenry in a in an almost citizen science way who is submitting um their own uh testimony if you will and what i was trying to do and at the time um when i first developed this is i was a lawyer practicing and this was in the united states and i thought well rather than just talking perhaps people can achieve a more common language by some sort of visual vocabulary and so chapter 5 of seeing the better city begins to bring in to your other question um the learning that i had as a lawyer about um how some of um how the rules the legal rules for um evidence and um the customary approach to hearings and proceedings you know formal proceedings might incorporate this more visual language so i'm trying to answer a couple of your questions at once that um I did give specific attention to those items in seeing the better city. Now in the new book, I take it even farther, and the new book is much more um almost a post-practice reflection on what motivates what what's really going on and how we might comprehensively enable local voices under an ideal structure to um to understand um places as they are today. because in so many places today um we are we are seeing a whole new um set of inhabitants that have nothing to do with the physical shells around them that may sometimes be hundreds of years old um many of your other questions speak to methods of participation and plurality um and how it is that um co-creation can come about and how to give voices to people and there are many many examples in chapters 3 and 5 I think of the new book about people who have tried to do that 
Um, so this is, unfortunately, there's not time to give you many examples, but I assure you that um, your questions are excellent. I've tried to at least start answering them already in the books themselves. And I'm not trying to sell books. I'm just saying that I hear you and these are good questions and, um, and I would commend to you um, a, a further look. Sure, sure. Thank you. And just, uh, Charles, just one last question. You have to have to go through like taking help of the legal process to like, let's say, to sometimes, as you say, you realize that even governments might not allow this process. But did you did you have to in any case take help of legal processes to allow such things to happen? Like, yes. Did, did that happen in your in your, yes. in your case? Yes. Often, often, well, you know, it's a question of yes. Sometimes to get people. Even even um, even in municipalities, particularly in the United States, where public participation is really guaranteed, and under the American model, due process is a constitutional guarantee. Or 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 in England, in the United Kingdom, where where people are allowed to submit their responses or their views on plans and developments and so on and so forth. It's, it's not always the case that, that people um, get to um, reflect appropriately on the impact of a development on their, on their surroundings. And, and that's what lawyers do sometimes. They, 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 they make government listen um, by citing rules or uh, legal doctrines that um, require government to, uh, to listen or to understand when processes have not been followed, or to understand when decisions are made without adequate um, findings or justifications. So yes, um, certainly. Although my book, how I write now is not really as a lawyer. Um, I am um, certainly motivated in what I'm interested in by all of the frustrations that I saw people had with process. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Binti? Yes, uh, I think uh, we are running a little behind schedule. And uh, thank you, Chef, for all your patiently answering our questions <laughs> and uh, Professor Paul's uh, reflections. And we're trying to understand because every time it so happens that, uh, you know, what are the methods that we develop to kind of understand our own context? Um, and uh, I'm glad that in your new book, uh, you are talking about that. So there's Urban Diary, then there is Lens, and now Learn. So uh, a lot of takeaways. And another thing which I really uh, love about this entire method is the coming together of the traditional anthropological observation method with the new digital tools that you Everybody mm -hmm. can use, you know, everybody has a smartphone these days. So everybody is an anthropologist. Everybody is an informed citizen. So, yes, as you say, co-creation is possible. And, and you know, uh, even in India, we see a lot of examples where these kind of things are happening. And the government has also become uh, quite uh, receptive of responses from citizens. So I think uh, it, it's possible. It's just that we need the right method and uh, we, we, we need to kind of be more proactive. Sometimes the citizens are also very lackadaisical. They don't want to participate. So, you know, it is it it works both ways. So I think we have to strike that balance and we got to negotiate. So thank you, Chuck. Over to you, Manoj. Thanks, uh, Charles. A uh, lot of uh, learnings, uh, I believe. Uh, uh, you have presented very gently and lucid way. Uh, there are things that definitely we understood when we look at uh, our own context uh, uh, being an urban uh, you know a design school we do a lot of studies of cities uh, in india and uh, when you presented things like you know inherent qualities what fits where and why uh, uh, the context and culture place adapt to city or uh, the ambiguity of character. I mean, a lot of this are, is something that we need to really uh, reflect on our, uh, on, you know, on, on our cities. And, uh, and I feel that uh, it's an important uh, uh, 
book. We have placed the order long back, but it has not come yet to the library. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but uh, we are waiting, and you know, uh, this is something that you know it all interests us tremendously. When 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 someone raises these questions on context and uh, character, so thank you very much. Thanks, uh, really. Uh, it has been a immense pleasure to have you, and I'm sure there are a lot of uh, questions that students would ask us in the class, maybe you know, next week. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, Sarah. Yeah, thanks, uh, Manoj. On uh, behalf of KRVIA, once again, I would like to thank Charles Wolf for sharing with us his thoughts and explorations uh, through his keynote on learning the city in transformative times. Thank you, sir. Uh, I would also like to thank all of you for being a part of this online event. But before we move on to the dissertation colloquium, we will now take a five minute break and be back online by 10.40 a.m. Thank you. <laughs>